Soviet Air Force Elyushin I-12 Sturmwerk took a heavy toll on German armor on the Eastern Front. In many ways, the Elyushin brand IL-4 was a forgotten bomber of the Second World War, at least in the West, though it formed the majority of Soviet bomber wings and produced more than 5,000 examples. The system performed admirably well and was of a sound design, though a poor defensive armament array ultimately led to high and unacceptable loses to the extent that production was completed by 1944. In any case, the system was a large part of Soviet Air Force and naval operations and was the first bomber of Soviet origins to attack from within Berlin airspace. The Luftwaffe took calling it the flying tank, concrete plane, or even iron Gustav because of its highly effective armor protection, while German tankers and infantrymen referred to it as the butcher because of the destruction left in the wake of an I-12 attack. The robust plane proved that it could more than hold its own against the vaunted Luftwaffe, especially as Soviet tactics improved and pilots gained experience against German flyers who became younger and the veterans fewer as the bloody Great Patriotic War pushed ever westward. The plane was so detested that it became a fairly common practice on the Eastern Front for frustrated and battle-weary Wehrmacht soldier to simply open the canopy of a down Sturmwerk and fire point blank into the head of an injured pilot. The I-1-2 series themselves also improved over time, moving from somewhat underpowered single-seaters to two-seaters with a more robust power plant and a machine gunner added behind the pilot to provide better protection against attacks from German fighters, particularly from above and behind. In many ways, the Sturmwerk was a forerunner of today's 18 Warthog developed by the Fairchild Republic for the U.S. Air Force and used for close air support, which is capable of providing punishing damage to hardened ground targets while protecting its pilot with its toughened shell. The 18 Thunderbolt Hog can spew 30 mm high explosive rounds from a 7 barreled high speed cannon protruding from its nose and can carry a deadly array of rockets and other weapons under its wings. The Stormbird was the right plane developed at the right time by the Soviets. It was designed for survival in the hostile flag and fighter field skies of the Eastern Front, where the Germans raced so much and suffered more than 70% of their casualties during World War II. The I-1-2 had a sturdy undercarriage that enabled often quickly trained pilots to take off and land on comparatively primitive airfields and it was praised for being easier than bombers to operate in adverse weather conditions. It was also relatively easy and inexpensive to produce, with more than 36,150 of all variants rolled out during the war, making it the most produced combat aircraft of all time. Like most aircraft, the Sturmwerk evolved from previously designed planes to meet a specific need, in this case close air support. The 1939 Mongolian-Manchurian border conflict with Japan, the Spanish Civil War, and the early Winter War with Finland all demonstrated the need for such an aircraft. Various designs were attempted, most employing Soviet RS-82 rockets for air-to-air -air attacks and later for air-to-ground attacks as well. Soviet lack of success in using such bombers as the Tupolev SB in the Spanish Civil War had caused the Red Air Force to shy away from the concept of strategic bombing in favor of fast-moving fighters to first gain air superiority and then to be employed in close air support. The decision to move toward a dedicated armored ground attack aircraft led 1938 to the development of the TSKB-55 which was later called the Ilyushin after Sergei Ilyushin, the project director. The plane first flew on October 2, 1939, a month after Germany, then the Soviet Union's ally, invaded Poland and ignited World War II in Europe. The craft at that trial stage was a two-seater single-engine monoplane. Vital components including the engine and the entire crew compartment were heavily armored and the plane was equipped with five 7.62 mm machine guns, one for defense and four in the wings for offensive fire capability. Armor plating of varying thicknesses was used rather than just a layering of armor over existing structures as was then most often done. 
Designer Elgin sought solid performance for the aircraft, which necessitated the selection of a more powerful and available liquid-cooled engine over an air-cooled radial option. He believed the armor plating would provide the necessary protection for the potentially vulnerable cooling system. El Yushin selected the Mikulian AM35 engine, which provided 1,350 horsepower on takeoff and gave the go-ahead for the development of even more powerful engines. Further engine improvements were made along with the modification of the glazing where the rear gunner was initially placed, giving rise to the nickname of Garbeti or Hunchback in Russian. The plane at that stage had two 20mm cannons and machine guns in the wings. Trials continued and the go-ahead for production was given in early March 1941, some three months before Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union on June 22 of that year. The Soviets came to appreciate the plane that the Germans described as the Butcher or Meat Grinder. Some of the I-1-2 series had nearly full metal fuselages, including metal wings, but because of wartime shortages of metal, other variations had wooden wings and still others wooden rear fuselages. Those with rear wooden fuselages needed additional reinforcement, with four metal strengthening ribs added in the field to the exterior of the fuselage. Field modifications occasionally included a ski-equipped versions and the cutting of a hole behind the canopy for the addition of a rear gunner position, the plane's second occupant using commandeered machine gun attached to a swivel mount. All types of Sturmivuks were exceptionally hardy and all were well armored. Even when one was shot down or heavily damaged, Soviet forces would retrieve and repair the plane or at least salvage parts for later use. A rather outstanding 90% of the damaged Elishas that were recovered were repaired and sent back into the air according to Soviet estimates. Operations in 1941 to 1942 had shown the need for a rear gunner to protect against fighter attacks from above and behind the pilot, especially once the Germans discovered the inherent weakness in the unprotected rear wooden fuselage. The problem was exacerbated by the lack of effective, if any, fighter escorts for the close air support planes during this initial period of the war. By September 1942, the Soviets began modifying the I-1-2 on the assembly lines to accommodate a rear gunner. The protective armor plating was extended, a semi-enclosed glass covering was added, and a rather crude strap seat was initially tossed in for the machine gunner. By the end of that year, some 1,452 seaters had been produced and all the airplane factories were producing the two seaters by February 1943. The more powerful AM38F boosted engine was installed, giving the craft more than 1,750 horsepower on takeoff to offset the added weight. The two-seater was also upgunned with two 37mm cannons mounted in streamlined pods under each wing. This gave the Soviet craft twice the cannon power of the American Bell P-39 Ira Cobra with its single 37mm cannon that the United States provided to the Soviet Union under the Land Lease Act. A Sturmivox cannon could certainly take out a light tank and had a decent chance of doing the same with a medium tank. The Soviets found that they reportedly could take out a Panzer Gap Wagen 5 Panther medium tank and even a heavy Panzer Gap Wagen. Six Tiger with a well-placed hit with an armor-piercing shell on the more thinly clad rear of the vehicle. Aiming the guns, though, was difficult and the heavy recoil necessitated re-aiming the cannon after only a few shots. As it turned out, by late 1943, the use of 37mm cannons on the Sturmivux was largely being phased out with the introduction of anti-tank bomblets, which proved exceptionally effective against tanks, artillery, and hardened encasements. The anti-tank aviation bomb series were small 5.5-pound armor piercing shaped bomblets capable of penetrating the top armor of any of the German tanks in the field. The anti-tank aviation bombs were dropped from altitudes as low as 320 feet and had a destructive zone of some 50 by 230 feet. They were first used in the Battle of Kirks and were found to be effective because the bomblets were much easier for inexperienced pilots to use than other anti-tank weapons. They also eliminated the downtime needed to re-aim the cannon. 
The initial use of the anti-tank evasion bombs proved to be a tactical surprise, reportedly dumbfounding the Germans and undermining their morale. The anti-tank evasion bombs were soon put into mass production and widely used from then on against German ground units, railway cars, bridges, and artillery units. For their part, the Germans responded to the new weapon by spreading out their tank formations, which in turn lessened their effectiveness and substantially compounded command and control issues for the Nazi tankers. The Soviets did not completely give up on the 37mm arm Sturmewuchs and they were employed in several circumstances, including against enemy naval forces. Other I-1-2 series were modified to become torpedo bombers. The two-seater did undergo additional changes as the war progressed, including the use of swept-back wings to offset the change in the center of gravity caused by the addition of the rear gunner. This led to much better control and stability and eliminated a complicated bungee spring and counterweight system on the elevator control. The swept-wing version went into production in late 1943, and the straight-wing I-1-2 series were completely phased out of the production lines early the following year. By the end of the war, some 17,000 of the two-seater swept-wing planes had been built, or 47% of the total produced. Not only did the plane evolve, but Soviet tactics did as well. Early war tactics involve a handful of I-1-2 series flying often unescorted against strong German defenses only to suffer significant losses from both enemy planes and flak. Early in the war, the experienced German pilots found it relatively easy to take down inexperienced Soviet pilots flying without fighter escorts. Attempts to have the I-1-2 series dive on targets from altitudes of 2,000 to 3,000 feet did result in increased efficiency but with increased losses from enemy planes and ground fire. The Soviets resorted to having the ground attack aircraft fly in larger groups of 8 to 12 planes, enabling the I-1-2 series to better protect each other by flying in a defensive circle, which the Germans called the will of death. Attacking in such groups also helped assure that the volleys of the somewhat inaccurate rockets would strike vital components of the German defenses. The changes also included having a few of the I-1-2 series initially attack German artillery positions to help lessen flak damage in subsequent attacks. The pilots also developed a zigzag system of attack that reduced the chances of being hit. Studies conducted on the Soviet test range revealed that it was more effective if rockets were used on the first run, followed by secondary runs with bombs and following runs with guns. Soviet flyers also discovered that while the Ilyusha was slower in a turn than German fighters, it could outturn them in the half-turn maneuver which enabled them to become the attackers. They also learned to suddenly slow the Sturmewicht so the German fighters would zip past and then become victims of the Soviet plane's heavy cannon and machine gun fire. They also learned to sideslip the I-1-2 in a 20-degree bank, creating aiming problems for the Germans. By late 1943, Soviet tactics had evolved to the point where the Sturmewicht had become a much feared weapon. Pilots had gained significant experience, and the Germans were forced to rely on fewer pilots with often inadequate training because of attrition in the East and escalated Allied pressure in North Africa, Sicily, and Italy. With fewer enemy fighters in the air, the will of death was modified from a defensive mode to a nearly purely offensive one as Soviet attackers circled the target with round after round of blistering fire until the targets were obliterated or the I-1-2 series ran out of ammunition. These attacks would sometimes last more than 90 minutes, and as the war progressed even more, I-1-2 series were added to the deadly wheels, often resulting in elongated formations of planes. The addition of radio sets also simplified and greatly improved aerial communications in the increasingly crowded skies. The Elyushin I-1-2 was built for business and could deal deadly blows to ground-based forces and equipment, even when located in hardened bunkers. The rockets, especially the RS-132 series, were powerful but were not overly accurate. However, they did prove particularly destructive, especially when fired in volleys from several planes. 
The aircraft also could carry upward of 216 bottles of incendiary liquid, which prove effective against armor and flak batteries as well. The success of the train station mission and others like it, executed with considerable heroism by the Sturmivok pilots, prompted Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin to issue an order calling for the continued attack of trains and convoys to disrupt German preparations for the upcoming Battle of Kursk. The famed tank battle that led to a near-continuous German backpedaling toward Berlin over the next two and a half years in the face of growing Soviet military prowess. After the war, the rear wooden fuselages were replaced with metal, which extended the useful life of many I-1-2 series. A large number were used well by foreign countries through the mid-1950s.